Well, um, I think we should uh, jump right in. So thank you for that gracious introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with my old friend, uh, Doug Brinkley. I, um, I remember when Doug's uh, the first, you know, it, it, would you call this a trilogy or is a, what's the word for, for four books? Yeah, well, uh, it'll be a quartet. It's really a, a trilogy quartet. now on the presidents because I did Theodore Roosevelt's era, FDR, and then the third wave of conservation environmentalism, which was Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, and the fourth wave we're looking for, which will be dealing with the age of climate. Yes. So I remember when uh, the Theodore Roosevelt book, Wilderness Warrior, came out and, you know, read that intensely and learned a bunch of things I didn't know. And along the way, I've, you know, read the other books and learned a, a huge number of things I didn't know. So I think we're just going to jump right in. Um, the new book is Silent Spring Revolution, John F. Kennedy, Rachel Carson, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and the Great Environmental Awakening. Um, it's really a long history of what we might call the environmental movement, or, you know, from its, you know, there really isn't a movement at the beginning of the book. There's a, a kind of conservation movement, a number of conservation activists. Uh, but along the way, we get introduced to debates about pesticides, DDT, chemicals, fallout from nuclear testing, nature writers and activists like Rachel Carson, presidents like JFK, LG, L, L, LBJ, Nixon, um, and we get in introduced to new terms like environmental law, which Doug reminds us uh, got invented in the 1960s um, in uh, 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 a narrative that he describes in the book. And at the end of the day, we actually have an environmental movement by the time we've come to the end of the book um, with massive participation in things like the first Earth Day. It's a, a popular uh, movement. Uh, it's, it's bipartisan, as Doug emphasizes. It's able to get legislation through Congress, even through people like John Ehrlichman, who, um, as many people in this room remember, was uh, Nixon's White House counsel and domestic policy advisor. And we mostly know him from the Watergate controversy. Uh, we don't imagine that he was a friend of the environment, but in fact, Doug shows us that he was and that uh, this movement that he chronicles was bipartisan. So I want to jump in, you know, a bunch of questions, uh, and then we'll take questions from the audience. But, but, but I want to start with, you know, so many of the stories of the people in your book start with their personal encounters with nature or the environment. Rachel Carson in her house in Pennsylvania, or John F. Kennedy in Hyannis with the sea. John Ehrlichman, you remind us, has these encounters with nature that uh, affect him deeply. So, so Doug, what, what's, what's your story? You know, you've written four books about the environmental movement and nature, and where, where's your own personal story in this? Well, it's a good, you know, my mom and dad were high school teachers, and you don't get paid a lot. I grew up in Georgia and Ohio, but you do get time off in the summers. That's the perk. And so we had a Pontiac station wagon and a 24-foot coachman trailer. And we are one of those proverbial families that put the cooler, the dog, and my sister and I piled in, and we would go all over the United States. Today they call it passports for the parks, but we would go to the Grand Canyon or the Everglades or the Great Smoky Mountains or the North Cascades of Wisconsin, and I just became spellbound by these trips. We would camp at state parks also or national forest areas. So I just, it, when I think of childhood, that's it for me. Those were the high water marks of my life. And when now uh, cut to the fact that I have three children, they're now going to college age, but when I started writing these books, they were young, and I decided I'm going to take them to all these special places and do research. So if I go to Joshua Tree National Park in California and write about Mir Mirvana Hoyt, a, a woman from Pasadena who saved the Joshua trees that were all being burned and cut down and went there and actually saved them, I could go to the archive at Joshua Tree while my kids did hiking, exploring. So it was really fun combo. Um, add to that, uh, I had asthma when I was a boy. It was particularly bad when I was in an urban area in the hot sun. 
and I read in a children's biography that Theodore Roosevelt had had asthma and he had overcome it, and he used to talk about nature as a curative, uh, which is not fully proven, but in TR's case, he was sick in New York City from the un unregulated pollution of the 1850s and 1860s, but when he went to the Catskills and Adirondacks, he'd feel like a, a million bucks. Um, and I had that experience. In fact, he, the reason they're building right now a Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library in North Dakota, it's where TR went after his mother and uh, wife died on the exact same day. And he put a big X in his diary and said, the light's gone out of my life forever. And he took the Northern Pacific, which dumped him off in the Dakota territories, Western North Dakota today. And he had the uh, Maltese Falcon, um, a Maltese Cross in the Elkhorn Ranch. He wrote about the uh, Little Missouri River ecosystem. He wrote about the Bighorns in Wyoming. No president has ever written about the natural world with the beauty of Theodore Roosevelt. In fact, if you really get the anthologies of the best nature writing in America and you start encountering different names, uh, TR's included in there with Annie Dillard or with Rachel Carson or, or um, you know, uh, and, and the like. I mean, he's that fine of writer about the natural world. And it all built on itself. So I now know the public lands. David Rubenstein, who you might know from TV, and I did an interview the other day, and out of nowhere, he said, Doug, do you want to work for in the White House? Would you ever work in the White House? I said, no, but I'd love to run the National Park Service. <laughs> and I meant that. I had said, one job I would love to do, because I, and it's not just the uh, big parks. I like a lot of the more obscure places. And uh, so that fueled all of this. But the health bit of asthma connects later because Rachel Carson's a revolution because she took old style conservation, outdoor, natural world thinking and married it to public health concerns. And today where Rachel Carson's shadow is the big figure because she was blowing whistle on things like environmental justice issues, why people of color, uh, particularly Navajo miners or um, people in Houston or Fort Myers, Florida, where all the junk and toxic debris from our industrial civilization is often placed in the poorest neighborhoods. And, and then also, re after World War II, beyond going to the parks and wilderness, and I write about all of that, it really became big of stopping nuclear testing because we were blowing up bombs willy-nilly in the Nevada range. People were getting sick. And Martin Luther King Jr. saying, uh, what good does it do to integrate the Greensboro lunch counter if the milk you're drinking is contaminated with strontium-90? Um, and so that fear of a nuclear contamination, DDT, pesticides. Uh, my friend Jonathan Alter was mentioning Jimmy Carter on his book. Do you guys realize Jimmy Carter's father died from pancreatic cancer? His mother died of pancreatic cancer. His brother Billy died of pancreatic cancer. His sister Ruth died of pancreatic cancer. His sister Gloria died of pancreatic cancer. Because he went to when he went to the Navy, they were spraying USDA, Department of Agriculture, spraying toxic pesticides on the peanut crops and, and cotton in South Georgia. And it's a, it's a cancer belt. Uh, and that affected all of Jimmy Carter's family. So, you know, this, this amount of our belief in chemistry, presto is going to create all these miracles, which it does. But we, we develop these chemicals in an in a unregulated fashion and, and hurry up in wind mode in World War II. And they, we started seeing some of the damage they were doing to fish and wildlife. Our symbol, the bald eagle, almost goes extinct due to DDT poisoning and the thinning of their shells and the like. So it's, it's the word conservation holds sway till the 1960s. Even Lyndon Johnson called his very far-reaching environmental program the new conservation. But it's by the late 60s the word environment enters our parlance. And today it's everything, environmental impact statements, environmental justice, ecology was a word played around there in the world. But look at today, every major university has environmental science, environmental programs, and I'm sure all of you know somebody who's engaged in working in that environmental field. And as Ken said, the term environmental law got born out of William O. J Douglas's desk at the Supreme Court 
but also when the Environmental Defense Fund of Long Island sued about spraying um, poisons over crops, and their slogan was, sue the bastards. And out of the sue the ba bastards, it became this whole world of environmental law that you sue polluters, sue people that are uh, not following the state, local, and federal laws and, and coming to natural resource management. Man, well, that's... Uh that that's quite an answer. I mean, no, no. I mean, it's quite an answer in the sense that I think Doug's point, I think, is that you know part of the narrative of the birth of the environmental movement is a narrative of imagination, right? That you know people encounter nature, they have personal encounters, and it affects them deeply. And so at you know, and and that story kind of runs all the way through. As a matter of fact, I think I think the two drivers of the narrative in your book are imagination uh, and science. These are the, the, the two things. Because um, by the middle of the book, science is really playing a key role in moving uh, from figures like, you know, with a, you know, we start with um, you know, Thoreau, people have read Thoreau, people are thinking about the environment. But then we get Rachel Carson, who you show, it's consuming and integrating science yes. into this lyrical narrative of what's happening with pesticides and the environment. So, I, you know, I want to, you know, play off of, uh, there's, there's a minor figure in your book, and, and you know, this is kind of coming, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Yeah. And you, you've got this wonderful story of um, him bringing a salamander to the White House and showing it to JFK, and his imagination is fired up and he becomes an environmental lawyer. But of course, we know Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, and the president is a kind of uh, vaccine disinformation person. Um, so can, can you just tell just a little bit about both what role does science and what role does imagination play in your story? And are they in conflict? Are they in? Well, the thing about you know, the Kennedy family is um, uh, Joe Kennedy, the old man, the rich patriarch, loved a what really was a Republican finance guy, but he adored William O. Douglas. Douglas came from Yakima, Washington. Douglas hitchhiked with hobos across the country. He looked like James Cagney. He was a boxing type. He would ride horses. He'd hike. He was about the strenuous life. And after he graduated from Columbia Law at the top of law, he became the Sterling Professor of Law at Yale. And then Douglas got hired by Joe Kennedy to um, get the bastards out of Wall Street, overlook people right, doing bank bankruptcies during the Depression, uh, and, and run the Security Exchange Commission, and get who are the bad actors on Wall Street. And Douglas would go after them with the zeal you see Bobby Kennedy Jr. today going after pharmaceutical companies. Douglas is a seminal figure because he the, he used to say to Jack Kennedy, Jack, the problem is with you. You don't haven't slept on the ground enough. Um, Bobby Jr. Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General, loved William O. Douglas. The Kennedys named one of their kids Douglas after William O. Douglas. But they went everywhere. Do you guys realize William O. Douglas in the fifties took Robert F. Kennedy to hike all over places, like including Siberia? And when they got way into Siberia backcountry, Bobby Kennedy got a, uh, uh, the, you know, I'm talking about the original RFK in the, in the 50s, um, got a burning fever, 104 degrees. And he then w goes into his tent there while Bobby is burning. And Douglas says, uh, Supreme Court Justice Douglas in Siberia says, well, this is where men leave each other. Uh, good luck. I've got to carry the trails calling me. <laughs> Douglas left in there. And uh, Ethel told me she was going to kill William O. Douglas. He left her, really, even today. She's 95, and I'm seeing her next week. She'll tell you she was pissed. <laughs> Douglas left her husband to die in the middle of Siberia. Bobby Kennedy never held it against Douglas because he was this Darwinian physical thing, uh, meaning Douglas is deeply invested in this, this idea of, of the natural selection and the natural world, and Douglas becomes the great environmental Supreme Court justice, um, and the, he, he runs the Kennedys. They go, he, he takes them everywhere. 
and Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy's junior dad, worshipped Bill Douglas. Uh, they went and did protest hikes together uh, to save the coast of the Olympic Peninsula. Ethel told me one night when Bill Douglas had four wives, so this was wife three, and that was scandalous for a Supreme Court justice to be in his last, he was like in his 60s, and the last girl, he, woman he married was 20-some years old. He met her in a cocktail lounge. <laughs> and, um, and they were hiking to save, stop a road from being built to save the coastline in Oregon, and they were way up in the woods, and the whole way there was a package wrapped and Bill, and Bill Douglas kept saying, this is for my wife, and it's going to be our anniversary, and no woman has ever gotten a gift like this. A lot of mystery on the trail, right? What it got tonight? What did he get her? It's so wrapped, so pretty. And Ethel said, you were wondering how many carats the diamonds were. Is it a long necklace? It must be something special. They opened it, and it was his boyhood axe. <laughs> That's what he got his wife for the... And so Douglas was an eccentric, brilliant environmental law. And before an EPA, which was not created until 1970, his office in the Supreme Court was full of conflict of interest in the sense that environmental groups, Sierra Club, Wilderness Society, they'd all bring Douglas stuff to Douglas. And he would operate in this. He Even in a letter to a professor at Yale said, I'm going to bend the law in favor of the environment and against the corporation. Bill Douglas. Um, and they, they went river rafting. Douglas would take the whole Kennedy family, went down the Grand Canyon River to stop a dam. They went down the Green River. They went down the, and up in Idaho. And a lot of the Kennedy kids thought of him as crazy Bill Douglas, but young Bobby Kennedy Jr. worships William O. Douglas. So if you want to understand motivations behind the presidential candidate, uh, Douglas, on his attacks on pharmaceuticals, on his attacks on the chemical industries, on his determination for river keeping, it all emanates from Douglas, who was seemed to be um, unhinged and unafraid to do things, um, to kind of return things to the natural order. So much so that I think you know, there's some people that think that if the world gets too populated, COVID could end up taking a generation out, that it's nature's selection going on. And, you know, uh, and so it's a heavy deal with Bobby Jr. And, uh, and he's just not the same guy he used to be. Um, I think over the years, something's happened. And, um, you know, I am a vaccine lover. Like you can, guys can go <laughs> shoot me up right now. I'm, I'm trying to get my neck. So. I, I, you know, but you ask me what, what, why he's wired. It comes out of this, um, this, this l uh, unusual way of looking at the human's role in the natural world. Yeah, well, that's that's really interesting. I I want to. You, you almost a answered this, but I want to kind of ask it anyway. Um, William O. Douglas, Supreme Court Justice and environmental activist. He's both things, and as you say, there there are things that he does that we would sort of look upon, we look askance upon if present day Supreme Court justices did them. As a matter of fact, we're in the middle of a big debate about the political activities and the conflict of interests among the current justices. Whereas Douglas will go out and do a kind of nature walk to stir up public sentiment against a proposed federal dam construction, right? So he is, doing and affecting federal policy as a Supreme Court justice in a really public way. I'm just wondering, like when you read about Douglas, do, 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 does it feel weird to you to see him do this? Are you conflicted in your own mind about whether Douglas did the right thing? His first big one was he, he saved the CNO Canal. They're going to build a road on it in Washington, D.C. Douglas hikes 186 miles down the canal saying no roadway as Supreme Court justice. In victory, he won that. The, the Washington Post, he made the editors, he challenged the Post editors to hike the CNO. They did, and they decided Douglas was right. It's probably had enough cultural, historic, and scenic virtues to save the CNO canal. Well, that only got him going. If you guys ever hear about the Arctic Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, the large refuge in Alaska, Eisenhower signs it on his way out because of Bill Douglas. Douglas, as Supreme Court justice, goes to the Arctic, that area, fishes, camps, documents the caribou, 
comes back, visits President Eisenhower, who was at Walter Reed, sat at his bed and said, on your goddamn way out, uh, Ike, and, 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 Douglas, and he didn't vote for Eisenhower. But I said, told Eisenhower, you got to demilitarize Antarctica and you got to save northern Alaska as the Arctic Reserve. And on his last days in office, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower did both. Um, so the Arctic only gets controversial because Prudhoe Bay, they found oil in 1968. And the oil companies said, oh, my God, we have given up this what looked like nothing but caribou herds, and it's a rich oil field. And the Douglas crowd, the environmentalists, said, too late. It's the, America's largest national wildlife refuge, and there's no drilling that's going to go on on it. The tundra is too fragile. So you're seeing Douglas. Douglas doesn't lose. Wherever he goes, he stops a dam in Kentucky. He goes to the Buffalo River and goes down it in Arkansas, and people shot at him. They put barbed wire at the Supreme Court justice, and he went with the painter Thomas Hart Benton, who would paint the Buffalo River in Arkansas, and Douglas would write about why that had to be an undammed river. So whenever you think of Douglas, he get he'd go to the spot, you know, and he'd then get the press to cover it. And he did these extraordinary protest wins. But what is weird mm -hmm. is that this is the sitting Supreme Court justice doing heavy duty activist work like you can't believe. And so the right went after him and they started trying to impeach him because he was writing articles in Avant Garde magazine. He'd write articles for Playboy at the Supreme Court about nature. Um, and they, they went after him, and they almost got him impeached because of this foundation. He was dabbling with a little like um, Clarence Thomas. Difference. He dies broke, William O. Douglas. Money is not his thing. He lives really off of a cot, all right? I mean, really, he got alimony and pocket money is Bill Douglas. So it, it, his motivations are different, but it is, uh, like Clarence Thomas, a very – tricky, slippery slope for somebody in the Supreme Court to be doing that. Mm -hmm. so, so let me, you know, the, you know, the other aspect to this is that you're writing this book in the present. As a matter of fact, you start the book about um, what it's, you know, how hot it is outside as you're completing the book and what it means to write a book like this in our moment. So I, I, I want to ask actually is the processes, are the processes you're, sees you're describing, are they, is this, is, is there a moment like our moment? Because, you know, you quite explicitly invite the reader to be inspired by this story and to go out and do something about the present. Well, so, so is, is their moment, our moment, is our moment different? How is our moment different? It's very different. Um, what happened after World War II is there became lanes. There became the anti-nuclear protest movement, the Wilderness National Park crowd, Sierra Club with photographer Ansel Adams doing calendars for posters and all of this. Um, and, and there became Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta out in San Joaquin Valley protesting against pesticides and you know really environmental justice coming to formation. Uh, all of these are out there, but they came together in a political way because the public said environment first. So in, in John F. Kennedy will do the first um, a, a Clean Air Act in December 63. All they could get done then was stationary pollution. Pollution from factories were regulated. Made a big difference. Then the next Clean Air Act of 1970 that Nixon signed went after cars. Station, and, and that was big. That's why you can breathe in Los Angeles and Pasadena. The smog got scrubbed out. It was much worse in the 60s in those cities than it is today. And then Nixon starts fighting against leaded gasoline and getting the lead out and lowering the from 75 miles an hour to 55 miles an hour. And you start getting bottle recycling and all. That's the state of Oregon really was pioneering. Oregon and Vermont always pioneering in new environmental mechanisms. But I think books played a lot in it. So not only Silent Spring Revolution, but uh, an Ansel Adams photographs. But Jack Kerouac wrote the Dharma Bums about the Cascades and about a new way of hiking, the Ruck Pack Revolution. Uh, the Army Surplus 
good starts giving birth to what today's Patagonia and REI and this, and now it's an economic green mm -hmm. force. These you know companies that promote outdoor tourism all beginning kayaking becomes a sport. Those plastic kayaks start getting quickly ginned up places, then and it became it. And and then like. Um, Characters like Lady Bird Johnson will start going no billboards. Uh, she would love the way, Lady Bird, what you're doing on Martha's Vineyard here, by the way. I was thinking of her. I've no, got to know her, her mind, and this is what she wanted. No tacky, ticky-tacky commercialism uh, in the wrong ways. Uh, never had a first lady promoting the environment like Lady Bird. Lyndon Johnson, like a frontier cowboy, he wanted the trails so he saved the Pacific Coast Trail and the, and, and the Appalachian Trail was done by LBJ. And instead of dams, which right FDR was all about, and rightfully so, we needed them, uh, you know, the Grand Coulee Dam and, you know, TBA and all of that, there was a feeling that pork was, is, this was becoming pork money. Every congressman wanted a bunch of dam money for dams that weren't needed. And so there became a big anti-dam, let the river run free movement. Frank Church, the senator from Idaho, was a big progenitor of that. And Johnson signed legislation on his way out. So we, in our country, you all own wild and scenic rivers, undammed and supposedly pristine parts of rivers that haven't been mauled by industrial society. For my book, when I interviewed Ralph Nader, who hits the stage as a big anti-DDT advocate with Rachel Carson, but wrote Unsafe at Any Speed in 1965, largely about seatbelts and companies. But that book was powerful when it came out. But the big thing that Nader told me from a long interview with him, he said, I'm going to ask you, Doug, one question. I grew up in Connecticut on my river, on my town. Why should I not be able to swim in my river? And why should I not be allowed to eat fish in my river? And he said, That's, is that a, am I a radical for asking that? And why do so many people think it's okay that all the rivers have been decimated and destroyed and unregulated and poisoned, that if you fall into the Mississippi, you want to go get a shot at a hospital? Or if you eat something, you're going to get ill from mercury poisoning? Or It's a simple question, Nader laid out there, basic. But, you know, that's kind of the, that was the logic of that era because... Uh, uh, we were really poisoning our country, um, and, and we had seen it before with the Dust Bowl under FDR, where we created green belts and soil conservation and stock ponds and all of that. In the 60s and 70s, it became a pop mass movement. So when you cut to, say, Earth Day 1970, all the top songs started coming out about the environment as much as civil rights. I mean, Marvin Gaye, mm -hmm. Mercy Me, The Ecology, mm -hmm. Joni Mitchell, you know, big yellow taxi, you know, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Uh, Pete Seeger uh, saving the Hudson River, you know, with this sloop and, and uh, creating the, the, the scenic Hudson movement. And uh, I'm simply suggesting rock and roll, painters, you know, the first Earth Day posters were all done by Robert Rauschenberg. Do you guys realize Andy Warhol did a series of endangered species that he painted to save animals? And you don't associate Warhol with, you know, wildlife protection things. So all of the arts and, 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 and Walter Cronkite, I'm his biographer. I wrote the book Cronkite. Cronkite loved the outdoor world, but particularly sailing, particularly Martha's Vineyard. But he uh, started saying after Neil Armstrong went on the moon, he came in on New Year's Eve, 1969, and told the whole CBS staff, we are going to do weekly showing of our planet being destroyed on CBS, and we're going to use as our bumper slide Bill Anders' Earthrise photograph, the astronaut who showed that iconic figure, you know, lonely planet Earth there. And Cronkite, just like Cronkite earlier was covering Vietnam or Martin Luther King Jr., they started in the early 70s showing regularly uh, how our America's of uh, the beautiful was being desecrated. And that had an impact on people. And when Nixon came in, he's only president seven days, and he has the Santa Barbara oil spill. And then he has the Cuyahoga River catching fire. And my only appreciation with Nixon from doing my book is he was smart enough to know that you guys were demanding clean air, clean water, and you wanted the condor manatee saved, et cetera. 
and Nixon triangulated it, just like he did with China, the most arch-communist, anti-communist politician for decades. Suddenly he's the one dining with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai. Car J J Nixon, suddenly the, the enemy of the environment in many people's mind, triangulates and creates the Environmental Protection Agency, Clean Air Acts, Clean Water Acts, Endangered Species, and even does business with David Brower, radical left Sierra Club, to do Golden Gate National Recreation Area in California or Gateway National Recreation. So Nixon was starting to even meet with environmentalists, I mean left environmentalists, but he never liked they didn't give him the love. They'd always say to them, I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm doing all this stuff and you guys still denounce mm -hmm. me, and that's because of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And he never could get credit from progressives for the progressive things he did. Okay, so, so let's do maybe one more question before we do uh, Q&A from the audience. And um, I, think we've got a, I think we've got a microphone over there. Um, so uh, we'll do this one, la one last question and we'll we get some questions from the audience. So, so this is a, it, it's a quite an inspiring book. You know, lots of people from various orientations on politics, on life, come to appreciate the environment and create the environmental movement. Um, you, you, you end the story in 1973 with the Endangered Species Act, um, when the story still is sort of bipartisan, although as you hint, Nixon's kind of changing. Um, and you do invite the reader to derive lessons from the book. So, of course, in the interim, as you say in your epilogue, you know, the, the, the entire counter-revolution, the Reagan revolution has happened. Um, we've got a bunch of science or supposed science on the, on the other side. So, so what lessons should the reader take from your book? Or, or at least the skeptical reader might say, Oh, here's a moment that's so much unlike our moment that we can't draw lessons from it. Can, can we draw lessons from well, it? Well, first off, I am here to tell you straight up that John F. Kennedy was a great president. And Kennedy heard about the nuclear testing, got the data, asked scientists, and women called Women's Strike for Peace by Dagmar Wilson, a children's book illustrator, organized in front of the White House picketing. Here are a group of angry women about nuclear testing in Nevada, and we've got to stop doing that. And he, Kennedy's looking at him out the window, and that night he calls the head of the march. I saw you guys in front of the White House. Uh, what, I'm, I'm with you. I've just got to figure out the politics of all this. And he then gets Norman Cousins, the editor of the Saturday Literary Review, who was an, a founder of SANE for our SANE future with Coretta Scott King, and Kennedy privately, behind the back of CIA, behind the back of defense, behind the back of the State Department, slips in Cousins for a meeting in the White House, and he becomes JFK's unofficial envoy, and they used as a decoy to go meet the Pope first. And he spent a little time with the Pope, and then he slipped it over to meet Khrushchev, and Cousins said Kennedy wants to ban the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere and underwater. He means it. Can you come to the table? And they use Cousins as what we call track two diplomacy, back channel diplomacy. And uh, lo and behold, at the American University speech in June of 1963, it's called Kennedy's peace speech, but he's saying we've got to live together and we're not going to be contaminating the world with nuclear weapons and he passes the, um, the test ban treaty, the nuclear test ban treaty. So that act by Kennedy came out of grassroots movements protesting with the president willing to listen and willing to go on Capitol Hill and, and find the votes, put capital into doing it. Um, I, I, I worry about it today because back in those the days I'm writing about, by 73 what happened, it was a progressive win on the environment. When I was giving you Douglas win, 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 all sorts of legislative wins, bipartisan, that Endangered Species Act, 50th anniversary now, all the animals you love. I mean, the alligator was going near extinct, and now they're everywhere. The Canada geese, can you believe? They're at every airport and everywhere you look, was near extinction. And, um, and they, they passed 92 to nothing in the Senate. All Republicans went with the act endangered species. Um, what happened? 
Um, that exact moment, the Arab oil embargo came. And Nixon sided with Israel, and they're in the war. And then they, the Arab nations got together, and gasoline prices went sky high. And there became the oil industry and gas industry started saying, you see these greenies, these lefties, later they'll call them tree huggers. They're, they're, you got to choose energy or environment. And a, they started building a very, very smart coalition with Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell and anti-William O. Douglas. They're two opposites. Powell said it'll take us 30 or 40 years, but we're going to undo all of these regulatory measures. And when you're looking at the Trump administration today, what they are trying to do is undo the legislation of Nixon on the environment. They're trying to gut EPA. They'd abolish it if they could. They want to water down the water, Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. They want wetlands not to be included, uh, et cetera. And so the, and with our country divided 50-50, unfortunately, you're either, if you're in the environment, you're a Democrat. If you're energy or, you know, you're, you're, pro, pro, you're put as a Republican, there's very little crossover going on right now, and it's unfortunate um, because there used to be one of my heroes in my book, a Republican congressman, John Salyer from Pennsylvania, who did all this incredible. There were a number of key Republicans, Lawrence Rockefeller, the great conservationist who saved the Tetons and, and the Redwood Forest and uh, Republican, uh, but it changed. And when Reagan came in, he brought in Watt, and then this um, these groups, particularly um, the Federalist Society, Cato, uh, the Koch brothers, Scafi brothers, um, and many, many more, founded a counter-revolution to undo Carsonism, William O. Douglasism, and Naderism, meaning the federal regulatory structure. And they're winning right now. We are they. They're, they, Reagan, I had edited Reagan's diaries, and in Ronald Reagan's diaries, the most telling passage, they were going to build the FDR memorial in D.C., which is, if you haven't gone, go. And Reagan, the Washington Post was saying Reagan wouldn't really want the FDR memorial, and Reagan writes in his diaries, how dare the Washington Post say that I voted for FDR four times. My dad wouldn't have lived without the work projects of the New Deal. What I want to do is roll back the Great Society, meaning the Johnson and Nixon legislation. And that was Reagan's objective, not to go back and, you know, what FDR saved, but that's, and that's what we're seeing going on. It's part of the cultural war now. The green, the environmental movement took the corporate world by surprise, by storm in the 60s, because Rachel Carson's book became such a catalyst and environmental law burst up, and, and if you were a polluter, you were getting sued. And the first head of the EPA, one of the greatest men I've ever met, William Ruckelshaus, Republican from Indiana, came in to run EPA under Nixon, and he busted the bad actors. He, I read letters from him to the city of Atlanta. I'm going to shut you guys down if you start putting raw sewage into, into the Catahoochee River. He did these everywhere. And you started getting a, 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 you know, companies behaving more responsibly for fear of the federal government, particularly the EPA. So we, we've got time for, we have actually exactly five minutes for questions. Um, so we'll try to have quick, quick. Uh, please uh, step up to the microphone over here to my left. Uh, we have time for quick questions and quick answers, and maybe we can get two in. Um, Come on, guys. Don't be shy. So I, I, there you go. Well, just come to, on up. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Tens of millions of people around the world, all of us, have just lived through probably the hottest summer uh, recorded. So the heat from the what was once the environment way out there has come in. Over all of us now, people should be more aware of it. What do you think the environmental movement ought to do to address this? On oh, this problem with CO2 emissions was for there, you can date it back if you want to play games to a man named Calendar, but really it was 1958 uh, when it was discovered that how, what we're living in right now, the true damage of climate change and the impact with CO2 emissions, 58 on the, te and TELUS uh, became the big person. Roger Revelle, who taught Al Gore at Harvard, was the one with this original science. 
in my book, John F. Kennedy Administration, there was a report about the dangers of climate change, but low level, I doubt Kennedy ever looked at it. Um, Johnson in 1965 warned about climate, but he had Medicaid, Medicare, civil rights, voting rights, you know, welfare, as of creating, you know, Department of Transportation, on and on and on. And it wasn't in his ballywick to take these reports too serious. Nixon, one of the greatest memos ever written in the Nixon papers are by Daniel Patrick Moynihan writing a letter to Richard Nixon. And the Moynihan letter says, uh, and uh, if any of you know who Moynihan, he had a great literary style about him, and it's a brilliant letter, but he said, look, I've looked into this, I've talked to the weather people. If climate is real, if this, re if this science is right, which I think it is, we are in deep trouble. Goodbye, Miami. Goodbye, New York City. The verdict on Seattle, not in. Moynihan to John Ehrlichman for the president's eyes in that early. And then Jimmy Carter had known about it and Reagan and all of them. No president's been a climate change success because unless you put it first and make it in the public screams and make it the thing, we can't hold presidential debates when reporters don't talk about climate change. T ten questions, still not the climate question, you know. And, and, and so what, what we're dealing with now is a global problem. Uh, this is the third wave in America. We're now experiencing the fourth wave. It's global. It deals with China and India, and uh, it's late. There's going to be problems. You may be affected when this Gulf current um, uh, starts having real problems with flooding on the East Coast, and maybe they're predicting in the next few years. Uh, so, guys, we're living it. It's not. There's no such thing as a climate denier anymore. They, I mean, the, the, it, it's about mitigation, adjustment, and 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 the hope that innovation in America, which we're the best at, our moonshots, can eventually figure out a way to wean us off of fossil fuels. I still don't know why coal is allowed to be used personally, but um, it's a longer story, and we have time for it today. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, sir. I, I, I have uh, one question, and that is we've, we've talked a lot about the background and the history, but looking forward, what do you see? I don't think with this divide the federal government can do it like it used to be able to do it. So everybody's looking for the president. There's no magic wand. So it's going to be by state, by state, by state, like so much now. So California, you're not going to be able to um, sell cars run on gasoline there in, in, uh, by 2030. It's not that far from now. I'm not saying it helps us in the next years. And now Oregon's just joined California, and I believe Washington is. So now you're on the West Coast that you're not going to be able to sell a vehicle that runs on fossil fuels in 2030. I'm picking just one of many state things. And if that starts happening, a good news is automakers, Ford, General Motors, Toyota, the rest, they don't, they're not into the gasoline world. They'll just as soon go electric or hydrogen fuel cell or solar if it can work. Um, and so you, you, I think, and like you're seeing with Tesla, eventually we'll be able to get cheaper cars not run on fossil fuels, but nothing's pretty. You start looking at an electric car and look how you have to mine for the copper and, and basalt and other, and that creates a new uh, range of problems. We are simply hostage to an industrial revolution run amok with nobody able to put brakes on it. And as Dr. Albert Schweitzer, the Nobel Prize winner who Rachel Carson loved, said humans are, are, were doomed if Thank we can't you. stop seeing ourselves as being um, conquering nature instead of living more in harmony with nature. On Martha's Vineyard, you guys are really working well and trying to live in harmony with nature. And I really appreciate it when I come here because I see it manifest itself in many ways. Thank you so much to our audience and especially to our wonderful speakers. Thank you. Um, Doug is walking over to the signing tent right there. You can all buy his book at the book tent. And our next uh, session is starting in four minutes with Jessamine Chan on the School for Good Mothers.